Uh, fantastic. We're, we're in business. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca for inviting me to give a talk here. It's a pleasure to be here talking about my favorite subject. So uh, game AI, it's a fascinating thing. By the way, we've got about 10 minutes for questions at the end. But if there's a burning question, please feel free to ask as we go through. There's a new research area that's not directly related to this called uh, digital archaea ludology, which imagine you're in an archaeological dig and you dig up something that's got squares on, like a board, and it's got some pieces on. <coughs> and the challenge is to try and figure out what the purpose of it is. Is it a game? If so, what are the rules? Uh, how does it relate to other things? Anyway. I was at this event uh, a few weeks ago, and has anybody heard of the, the programming language, Java? So we were, we were talking about this, and uh, we were talking about um, this, uh, oh, and we're going to do this in Java, and uh, oh, that, that thing was done in Java. And one of the historians or anthropologists, after a while he just exploded, he said, look, there's absolutely no evidence that they play these games in Java. There's just nothing at all. Yeah, we were talking about part of Indonesia. So sometimes, um, given public things like this, there can be big misunderstandings. So like, that's a long way of saying if you've got a burning question, just, just ask it as we go through. Uh, OK, so we're applying game AI to operational uh, decision support. We're working with the Defense Science and Technology Lab. And this was something that's been set up through the Alan Turing Institute, uh, which is a fantastic organization. And I think they're very uh, welcoming to anyone with AI problems that need solving. Uh, so please uh, get in contact. So we really do game AI, but increasingly game AI is becoming more and more powerful. And we would love to have ways of solving real world problems using game AI. So what really got us hooked on this is uh, DSDL came to us and said, uh, well, an example of what we need to do is uh, called the well problem. So the military, they don't just bomb people. They do lots of... Um, Lots of uh, fantastic uh, things to make life better as well. And one of the things of military campaigns is also winning hearts and minds. Uh, so there was a particular country that we were involved with, and uh, they wanted to win hearts and minds. So they observed that the people of the village, especially the women of the village, had to walk a mile to the nearest well every day and a mile back again. This seemed like a real drudgery. And they said, well, what we'll do, we'll install a well. So they got the, the Royal Engineering Corps, um, did a survey, geological type survey, figured out where the water was, uh, put a well in the middle of the village, functioned perfectly. And what do you think happened? It's a bit of a rhetorical question. But actually, what they thought was going to be a fantastic way to win hearts and minds, it turned out to be uh, like a bit of a disaster. So for this particular country, uh, it turned out that the women were quite suppressed by the, the men folk in the village. And that walk to the well and back was the highlight of the day. And of course, everybody needed water. This is something that you had to do, so it couldn't be taken away. So that really backfired. And so one thing that we want to do for operational decision making is can we use game AI to make better high-level decisions? So what we're trying to avoid are these type of unintended consequences. So sometimes you, know, you might make a decision with, with bad intentions. Well, we're not really addressing that. But imagine you've got the best intentions in the world, and you want to make a really good decision. How can we simulate things better to try to ensure that the consequences of the decision are in line with the original goals? So that's one of the things that we want to do. Uh, so. We, we've, uh, at Queen Mary University, we've got a, a significant game AI group. We've got about 30 people in it now. And game AI is a fascinating area. So always in a game, the problem you're trying to solve is, I've got an interesting situation, and what shall I do next? It's much like life, right? So all the time, you've got interesting situations, and all the time, you're trying to come up with a solution as to, what am I going to do next? Uh, so we think there's, there's increasing potential to apply this to uh, real-world decision-making more and more. Uh, so just some, some sort of game things. Uh, there's a popular game called uh, Dota 2. There's a big AI organization called OpenAI, and they got uh, uh, a bit of um, publicity about a year ago when they, they got uh, to be human competitive in this 
complex game called Dota 2, and it also generated some interest from the military. So if we've got these sort of battle <coughs> games that AI is now good at, uh, perhaps we can use this sort of AI for better human decision making. Uh, so, so recent progress in, in Go um, and game AI in general. Uh, I, I think one thing we should be proud of is uh, this fantastic company DeepMind based in London. So Google DeepMind have made some amaz amazing progress in, in game AI recently. Uh, so a few years ago, they developed the first human competitive Go playing algorithm. Uh, it was called AlphaGo at the time. Uh, and this was initially based on learning from human gameplay, which it then improved and uh, used some sophisticated al algorithms. And amazingly, they beat the, the best human player in the world at the time, Lee Sedan. So that was a fantastic achievement. Uh, so Go is thought to be at least 3,000 years old. It's an ancient game that's been studied for a long, long time. Uh, it's a game that humans train from an early age to be as good as they can at, if, if they're going to become Go masters. And then DeepMind more recently did something even more amazing. They built a computer Go system called AlphaGo Zero that ignored all the human knowledge. And it just, through self-play, just playing lots of games against itself, got better and better over time and exceeded the performance of the original AlphaGo. And we also study something called general video game AI, which is developing AI that's going to be uh, intelligent across a whole range of games. And that, that's uh, also a very interesting challenge. So the real significance of this is that here we've got games that require lots of intelligence to play, and yet we have machines that can learn to play them to a superhuman level um, just through the experience of playing them. So can we, do, can we apply this to real-world decision-making? Uh, so these um, things from DeepMind, they're all based on deep reinforcement learning. Uh, so with deep reinforcement learning, you've got a large neural network modeled roughly on the brain, very, very, very roughly, all right? And what you do uh, through experience, you train the network to get better and better at a, at a particular task over time. Uh, some of the things against this is that it can have relatively long training times, and it's not very adaptive. So what you learn, uh, so for example, when you've learned to play Go, that tells you nothing about um, how, to, how to catch a bus or anything. So how can you build things which are more adaptive and also more explainable? So some of the challenges we face in game AI are to make things that can learn really rapidly. So how can we have systems where, uh, a bit like a human being, I could give any of you now a new problem, and you probably wouldn't solve it brilliantly, but you'd probably solve it adequately, depending on the nature of the problem. So how can we develop AI that's more human-like in, in that sort of way? Uh, so some of the challenges, uh, can we learn more rapidly? Can we deal with large numbers of actors in a game or large uh, numbers of people in a real-world situation? Uh, can we have AI that can cope with open-ended decision spaces? Uh, so um, I'm, a, I'm a head of school at, at, uh, at a university and I'm making decisions all the time that are really complex and involve me doing things like uh, talking to people and writing emails and reading things, really, really sort of complex, open-ended decision making. And one of the other pushes in game AI is to develop AI that can play games based on these sort of things, and then again, transfer this sort of ability into the real world. Uh, real world is really complex, and it's only partially observable. So whatever we observe, we just observe in tiny fragments of the whole world, right? And so, how can we deal with all this uncertainty, with all these things that we're not observing and we're just making guesses about the sort of state of uh, other systems and the, the state of beliefs of, of other systems too? Uh, so what we do is something called statistical forward planning, which offers a general solution to, to some of these problems. And uh, I guess you, you've all heard of deep learning, right? It uh, powers your speech recognition on your phone or computer vision algorithms, all this sort of stuff. So what we uh, think about in statistical forward planning is, is, is this significant enough to be called the next deep learning? And, and maybe it is. Uh, so what, um, what we're aiming for is to take a system and model it. And what we're going to do now is run simulations of the system much faster than real time. And from those simulations, we're going to observe the outcomes 
and we're going to take the actions that lead to the outcomes we want. It's an incredibly simple idea, right? So we're just going to have a model, use it to simulate things, and um, yeah, just uh, tune a sequence to, to get good performance. So the idea is we've got a sequence of actions. Uh, we can even start with a random sequence. That's what we typically do, to start with a random sequence of actions, but then we evolve it to make it better over time, to make it lead to better outcomes rather than just random outcomes. And over time, we end up with clever behavior. Uh, so this is also a tunable sort of AI. So what's really cool about this, sometimes when you're modeling um, a complex situation, you might want to model a, a whole range of intelligences. So you might want to model some agents or some people who are going to behave stupidly. Uh, some are going to behave with uh, kind of moderate intelligence. Some are going to behave very cleverly. And so we can tune the algorithm to be either very greedy and short-sighted, more long-sighted. Uh, we can tune how thorough the algorithm is. And we can tune how consistent it is. So does it keep changing its mind every second? Or does it have more kind of long-term consistency? Um, so uh, what, what we do is um, model complex games. I won't go into the details of this, but this is a game a little bit like StarCraft. It's a game that you're controlling lots of units that build other units and then go into battle. It's a really, really tough control problem. And when people try to code up algorithms to solve this, uh, they end up doing this sort of thing. Now, I'm not going to test you on this. And there's a quiz in the interval. Uh, I can guarantee that there won't be a quiz question on what's on those boxes. So you don't need to study it in too detail. J just have a look, though, at the kind of size of it, right? So it's a complex decision process. The diamonds are conditional statements. And the, uh, the rectangles, they're kind of actions that you do. So the idea is you start at the, the root of the diagram. You follow it through based on all those conditions. And you end up with an action. And you say, OK, I'm going to uh, build a new base here. Or I'm going to invade this territory. And it uh, gets through into that um, military type of action. Uh, so the amazing thing is that instead of having to hand program that type of complex algorithm, instead we can just take simulation-based AI. And what we're going to do now, instead of programming anything, we're just going to evolve action sequences. And we're going to look at the outcomes. And we're just going to prefer things that lead to better outcomes. The overall idea is that simple. Uh, so I'll show examples uh, that are a little bit, um, little bit simpler than that. Uh, but it's the same sort of idea. So in a minute, I'll show an example with uh, the game on the left. is a classic arcade game called Asteroids, which looking around one or two people have probably played it. Maybe not everyone. And the one on the right is, is uh, Planet Wars. Uh, has anybody played Planet Wars? You can play it on your phone. It goes in the name of Galcon, Planetary Wars. It's on iOS. It's on Android. It's a brilliant real-time strategy game. Very, very simple. If you want to get into RTS games, very much recommend it. Uh, and uh, again, if you play that game, so it's, um, it's this one shown here. And you see the, uh, th these are sort of planets in a gravity field. And what you're trying to do is invade one planet from another. So there's a yellow player, there's a blue player, and the gray ones are neutral planets. And whenever you own a planet, you grow ships on the planet. And the object is to just take over the universe, as it would be. So the, um, it's a really complex game because the larger planets grow ships more quickly, so they're more valuable. But then again, the, the smaller ones might be easier to take over and less, less competed for. And it takes a while for these transits to get from one planet to another. And it's, uh, it's really sort of complex spatio-temporal decision making. Now, what we find is that this statistical simulation AI that I'm talking about uh, often outperforms fairly sophisticated hand-programmed algorithms. And it's, uh, it's an amazing thing that it does that. So we'll see a demo of that in a minute. Uh, I don't want to get into um, too much technical detail. But the key thing that enables all of this is what's called a forward model or a world model. And what it means is that you've got a simulation model. So it means that you can take the current state of the system, and then you apply an action. So the, start, the current state is called S for state. A is a, an action or a set of actions. So having applied that, you're now in a new system state called S prime. And that's the, that's the essential thing you need. 
So you have to have a forward model to apply this. Uh, okay, so just want to say a little bit about creating and searching spaces. So in things like AI and game AI, people talk a lot about the, the size of a search space. Uh, I just want to show that it's not that important. So this is a search space. It's a 200 by 200 binary image. Uh, so it's got 40,000 pixels. Can anyone tell me how many possible images there are of that type? I'll give you 10 seconds to answer. There's a lot. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. Can you have one point for the quiz? Uh, there are a lot. Yeah, so actually, um, we can even put a number on it. Uh, it's simply 2 to the 40,000. So it's really, really very a lot. Uh, now, if we take an image, we can create chaos from an ordered image. So that's a binary image of a couple of dice. And now what's going to happen is when I hit return, it should start to degrade. And what you see is I'm adding random noise to it. And for a while, you can more or less make out the, the picture of the dice. But after a while, it, it just disappears. So what we find over time is shown the graph here. As we add more random noise to it, initially it goes through a fairly steep descent, and then it's in the kind of random noisy type area. That's kind of easy, right? So you can take a car, and you can take a hammer sledgehammer to do it and start bashing it up. You can scrap it. You can do all kinds of damage to it. So to take something that uh, works and is beautiful and damage it, that, that's not hard. That, that's all too easy. But can we do it the other way around? Can we turn order? Um, sorry, can we turn chaos into order? Uh, perhaps evolve something new or brilliant. So the idea is that we can, and it's via a process called simulated evolution. So the algorithm that I'm going to show you playing all these games in a minute, it's all based on simulated evolution. And not only that, it's based on the simplest possible version of simulated evolution. What we're going to do, we start with a bunch of randomly generated solutions. Uh, we evaluate them, so check how good they are. And then we generate new ones just by mutating the best ones. So we've got a sequence. If it's pretty good, one of the best ones, I'll just add some random noise to it, and we'll end up with... Uh, some different ones. Now, they may be worse or they may be better. If they're better, we'll keep them. If they're worse, we'll just throw them away. And we just repeat those above steps many times. That's all we do. Uh, so let's see this now. Uh, if you can recognize this, this image, just uh, shout out as, as soon as you do. It's a uh, crown. So actually, Queen Mary's logo. Now, what you'll notice is that um, it's still getting better. So what we're doing, we're running an evolutionary algorithm. So every time, I'm just, mute, I'm just flipping pixels at random. And if those pixels that I flip lead to a, an image that's closer to the actual logo, I accept it. Otherwise, I reject it. So that's a simple visualization of an evolutionary algorithm. And it's exactly that algorithm that we're now going to use to power our AI. Now, interestingly, uh, what you'll have noticed is that in the early stage of that, it went from total chaos to something you could just, it was like coming out of the mist, right? You could just about recognize what it was. And after a while, it got better and better. But it never got perfect. I didn't run it for long enough to get perfect. And the point I really want to drive home is that actually much of real life decision making is more like that, right? So you're never going to get perfect decisions in real life. Not really most of the time anyway because life is far too complex. There are too many unknowns and unknown unknowns and all that kind of stuff. So very often, it's just all you need to be is on this part of the curve. So here's random behavior here. And as you improve from that, you improve very, very rapidly. And then as you try and get to perfection, that takes really, really a long time. And so we can, um, we can use these principles to create general game AI and potentially general real-world AI. So what we do, we take copies of a game state, evolve action sequences to meet the best outcomes, and um, we'll find that this works well across a range of games. Uh, that can be a little bit abstract in that description. So imagine you've got a, a simple sort of arcade game, and you're going to control a spaceship. It's actually asteroids. 
So the actions you've got, you can thrust, you can turn left, you can shoot, which is called fire, turn left, and so on. And imagine I started with a random sequence of actions. So imagine you've got a monkey on a keyboard just uh, tapping those things at random, right? And we found actually even that random sequence scored 250 points. So we make a few changes, and now instead of uh, turning left at the second move, I'm now turning right. Oh, well, actually, that led to a score of 350 points. So I'm going to prefer this sequence. And those, that, that's a kind of uh, level of simplicity of these algorithms that we're talking about. Uh, so in the case of uh, Planet Wars, what we're doing, we're invading one planet from another. And there's a sequence there. So each sequence now is just a sequence of numbers. And we interpret these as pairs. So that says uh, send ships from planet 2 to plan planet 17 and so on. And we're looking quite a long way into the future. We're looking about 100 steps into the future. And that led to a score of 93. We make some mutations. Oh, and that led to a score of 472. Now, these are just expected outcomes. It's just statistical simulation. We actually have no idea what the opponent's going to do. And what the opponent's going to do is going to have a massive effect on whether that's a good move or a bad move. It's a really incredible thing. So in statistical forward planning, uh, it, it shouldn't work, right? So things like um, the algorithms behind Computer Go, the, the early ones, uh, they're, they're based initially on random simulations. And when people try and do a complex task, we know they don't do it randomly. They put a lot of thought into it to try and be as clever as possible. And yet these damn silly algorithms, they still work. And they work really well. Uh, so what you're going to see in the demos, for each of the demos, uh, well, not all of them, but most of them, there'll be a graph on the left and the game on the right. So what this is going to illustrate, uh, let me just explain it once to begin with. Uh, this is looking into the future. So this is called the rollout depth. This is how many steps I'm simulating into the future. And then the lines, this is the expected score based on simulating that sequence. Now, I could take the same sequence and simulate it a number of times, and in a, in a kind of stochastic game, I'll get different outcomes every time. That, that doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to, anyway, take the action that led to the best outcome. So here, that red line corresponding to a sequence of actions, that was the best one. So I'll take whatever action was at the start of that red line. Now, in the game space, I can simulate where the spaceship's going to be based on these actions, and each of these pink lines is where the ship expects to be. It's not a perfect representation because actually the simulation is running the whole game state forward as well, not just moving the ship. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, so I don't, have, I don't have too much time left, but I think we started a few minutes late, didn't we, Rebecca? We did. Uh, so I'll just show a few demos now. I think I've conveyed the basic, basic ideas. Last couple of slides. Uh, so what does it mean for military decision-making and, and decision-making in general? Um, what we can do if we have a simulation model, and it doesn't have to be a perfect one, uh, then as soon as we can simulate things, we can get instant, fairly clever AI. By doing deep learning, we can make it even cleverer, but just out of the box, it's already going to be reasonably clever for many, many problems. Uh, can we solve the well problem that we started with? Maybe. That's like a longer story, but, but maybe we can. Uh, so I think we can do lots of much better real-world decision-making if we have good enough models. Uh, one other thing, I just want to mention this. So one of the most depressing things about recent politics has been the pretense that life is a zero-sum game and that things like trade negotiations are zero-sum games. Uh, game theory is much more sophisticated than that. Things are not zero-sum games. And life shouldn't be treated like that. So I just want to mention that before I finish. Uh, but we can definitely use game AI to make, uh, to make the real world a better place and have more intelligent decision making, where we can observe the consequences of the actions and just say, actually, that was an unintended consequence. I really didn't want that to happen. I was trying to make a decision with the best intentions in mind. Now I've done all the simulations, and I can see that actually is a really bad idea. So I'm not going to do it. So that's one of the big ideas of this area. And I'll stop there for some questions. Yeah. Machine learning and AI, what's, what's the difference, or are they the same? Uh, I would say machine learning is a subset of AI. Uh, so AI involves things like uh, automatic theorem-proving systems, which don't necessarily have any machine learning in it. 
Uh, it involves things like uh, schedulers that sort out timetables and plan airline routes. Uh, that those, I mean, these days they often have machine learning in them anyway, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have machine learning in. So AI, I think, is, is just anything that uh, we would judge required some intelligence to do it. And, um, and machine learning can often be used to boost that intelligence, but it's not an essential thing. Yeah. So these are all examples which are basically games. But you started by saying that you take a lot of decisions every day. And yeah, yeah. Um, which cannot, I don't know, it's very difficult. Let's say you have to hire someone. Yeah. Um, so you have to decide, or you have, you have like three candidates and you have to choose. How would something like this be used? Uh, <coughs> so it, it, so whenever it yeah, yeah. The outcome is not very yeah. easy to, cal to, to calculate how, you know, what it So, so what, what I'd say is that um, for things like that, I mean, that, that's an exceptionally hard example because it's so human based. So how do you judge whether, who's going to be the best candidate? And I think all the machine learning and AI type things would be uh, to just say things like, uh, the more you can go on the track record, it's going to be a, a better thing. How can you use simulation-based AI? Uh, I think that's one where it is probably more difficult because it's so human. I mean, who you, who you hire. But I think on the AI side, you can definitely use AI to make better decisions. I think in, in uh, universities, we do this all the time. Uh, not that sophisticated in AI, but compared to a normal interview process, we have the advantage of looking at uh, somebody's publication profile. And that's probably, if you're hiring a researcher, that's the best guide to how good they're going to be in the future. But it's not particularly related to what I'm talking about here. So I think it's, um, you know, with this sort of simulation-based <coughs> AI, I don't think we can solve everything yet. But we can, we can apply it to more things than it's currently being applied to. And the other thing about this is that the simulations don't have to be perfect. That's a really key thing. And I think the more that you simulate things, you sort of learn things anyway. Uh, so th this example of hiring people, I think um, one of the things that um, the simulation model gives you pretty quickly, actually, is just the idea that you are going to lose people over time. Now, that's kind of obvious anyway. But as soon as you start simulating it, you think, well, if I'm worried about hiring too many lecturers, um, how worried should I be? Well, actually, not that worried, because if I over-recruit a bit, then in the simulation model, I'm going to lose 10% of my staff within the next three years anyway. <coughs> so that's, that's a kind of maybe a bit more of a basic example. Uh, but it's, it's just really saying that the more you simulate things and the closer the simulations are to reality, then the cleverer the <coughs> AI can become. And actually, some we can simulate by our own brain. Ah, no, 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 no. You can do much, much better with the AI. Much better. Much better. So we're very limited in, in what we can do with our own imaginations. I speak for myself. <laughs> <laughs> with what you showed before about how it's working, with kind of that approach of evolving it, how do you, how do you avoid sort of local minima to the solutions, or do you introduce kind of randomness to...? Uh, so one, one of the things, um, this actually comes back to that, um, that curve there. So in, by the, by the way, in, um, in search or optimization, the problem of local minima, imagine you're trying to uh, minimize a function, like, like the cost of an operation. Uh, and if the, if the kind of surface looks all over the place like that, you might think you've got the best solution, but actually over here there was a much better one that would save you uh, like £100,000 a month or something. Uh, so with real-world decision-making, very often it's so noisy and so complex that it's, um, the local minima is not the, is not the biggest problem. The problem really is getting better models. And we're very often in... Um, S s sort of in, in this area of the, the graph. What we find when we do this type of search is that the, the mutation rate, so mutation rate, you've got a solution, and how many bits of it you're going to change, uh, we find that the mutation rate is really high. And that means that we're not actually that close to the optima. These, a lot of the problems, they're, they're so tough, they're so complex, 
that you're never going to be that close to the optima. Uh, well, let's say there's lots of room for improvement in lots of human decision-making processes. Do you want me to say anything? Okay, thank you.